Hello, folks. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, evening, whatever you are. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. So I put a good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the September uh, first Tuesday of the month uh, tag observability meeting. Um, uh, I have to say I'm on a, a connection that's unstable. Um, internet service providers in my building are doing work, so if I drop, that's why. Uh, but we've got the meeting open. Uh, I've put a link to the document uh, for where, where you can sign in and or add things to the agenda uh, as necessary. Uh, in addition, uh, at the top, I'll say this is a CNCF event. The code of conduct does apply. Uh, please don't do or say anything in chat. Um, that would be a violation of that code. Um, and with that, uh, good morning. Uh, is anyone here for the first time? If so, feel free to um, say hi. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. This is Sai. I'm here for the first time and got a couple of other colleagues also joining here for the first time. Nice to see you all. Hi, Sai. Welcome on board. <laughs> I think you're one of the presenters today. So, welcome. Yes, thanks for having us. And Sandor, hi. Uh, welcome also. Uh, I know yeah. you're also presenting. Uh, yeah, hi from my side. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Great to be here. Great to see you here. Thank you. Uh, I, in, in addition, I know it's not uh, formally on the agenda. And so, VJ, feel free to tell me uh, to, to come back in a couple of weeks, but uh, if there are any updates from your working group, um, I'm sure those in attendance and those watching the recording later would love to hear it. Um, uh, one piece of administrivia, um, I'm noticing that uh, there's a few videos that need to be posted still. Um, I'm back yeah, Matt, help. I think uh, we need to post uh, those, but no worries, we'll get them posted. With that, let's, um, <laughs> let's, let's get on. started. Yeah. So, um, Who's going to go first? Uh, Sandor, did you want to go first? or I think, Sai, you were in line first, right? And then Sandor? It's all good for me. I can start if you want to. OK. Yeah, why don't you go? Yeah, I can and, go. And we, I mean, have, yeah. we have about, um, uh, we typically keep this meeting about 50 minutes. Uh, but again, 25 minutes you know, for each presentation would be great with some Q&A. Yeah, sure. I will try to keep it uh, very short. Okay, and good. <laughs> always feel free to interrupt if you can't see my screen or don't understand something that I'm saying. I have, you know, sometimes I mistake that everyone knows what I'm doing and just, you know, skipping some information. No worries, no worries. We'll keep our, uh, we'll keep asking questions in chat, uh, but then you can present first and then we can just ask. Unless something is, you know, like somebody really has a big question in the middle of the presentation. Yeah. Um, uh, small point of one or two, we, we have something of a tradition um, over the last three years or so where folks have, un uh, I always ask the same set of questions at the end and I'll just, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll preload them now. So feel free to cover them at the tail end, but they're typically, uh, how can new contributors best engage with your project? Uh, what's your governance structure? And, and I'm sure you're going to cover these things anyway. Uh, but um, as we have multiple presentations, I'll just, I'll, I'll see the pot there. So if you'd cover that, uh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. I think I will uh, just cover it in the presentation, maybe at the end. Uh, I need to just quickly rejoin because of permission issues. Of, of oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> and Sai, you might also check because uh, then you can go right after. Vishnu, you were going to take the screen. So, so do you don't mind checking? When you share. Uh, I think you end up re having to rejoin because of just not being able to. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, cool. This was just a test. Am I still sharing screen or something? I thought I was going to try something and looks like I did. Okay. Cool, we're able to see your screen as well, Vishnu. I think you're good. Yeah. Yeah, all good. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, I'm Sandor back. Sandor could join back. Cool. Hi, Sandor. Please stop. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I got a lot of sharing. You know, Google Meet, WebEx, <laughs> Zoom. I good point. <laughs> forgot what have permission and whatnot. 
Yeah. So hopefully you are seeing my screen. Yes. So let's start. Uh, I will try to be short on the slides. Uh, just a quick intro why we do this project, how it started. And after that, I will do the hands-on demo to, to uh, provide you a feeling how it, uh, how it goes with the logging operator. First of all, just a bit talking about Kubernetes logging. I'm sure this uh, uh, team or <laughs> group has very a good understanding about that. But, you know, uh, Kubernetes doesn't really care much about logging. It just uh, let the uh, image uh, runtime to put the logs on the standard output and uh, save it in files on the nodes. And the kubectl logs can tell those files. And pretty much that's all. And uh, this is very good for like, you know, uh, debugging and whatsoever. But if you want to operate in production, you need to collect those logs, transport somewhere. And to do that, you need like access to the host file system or you need like custom logging in your application to just uh, skip the whole Kubernetes part together. But it seems that uh, most of the folks out there using the built-in logging because they have the kubectl logs command and whatsoever still in place if anything happens. So how it's all started, the logging in Kubernetes is not flexible enough. There is a lot of good resource management there, the airbox quotas, namespaces in Kubernetes, but all those are not uh, really applicable on logs. So, and there are a lot of different uh, personas using the logs. So the developers using development and debugging, the operational team, of course, ha have uh, the logs for uh, health checks, troubleshooting whatsoever, and the security team for incident detection, compliance, and, and so on. And all these need, you know, different aspects of logs and usually more than one team uh, needs the same logs. And what is the problem with this? There is conflicts during the management. So usually there is no self-service that developers can say, yeah, I want those logs to here or there because they are just simply not accessing those privileged containers, privileged configuration. That means that you can uh, alter where logs are coming and going. And uh, operators and SRE teams depends on developers because the log formats and you know different application what they deploy it's it's their usually their responsibility. And uh, when you try to do it by hand, and you know imagine if everyone has you know like access to the configuration, it's very fragile, very easy to step on each other toes because it just you know you simply don't know how you uh, why that configuration may be in place there and you can easily like shadow configuration if you like catch all logs before somebody has rules uh, can apply to that so this was the main area like three four or five years ago when we started the whole project um i was still working at uh, like ibm to uh, think about this and after that we uh, uh, we started the project in Bonsai Cloud, uh, a startup in a startup, and the goal was to provide a self-service environment for logging and have the same feeling like other Kubernetes resources. So you can manage your logs, your pod logs. You can, uh, as an operator, access to every logs on a cluster and do it in a more structured way than just using the kubectl logs command or just you know uh, grabbing all the logs and uh, solve this problem on the uh, collection or the database side. So we we wanted to uh, empower this stack to run configuration checks on these collectors, provide status and metrics uh, of these resources, uh, give some basic secret management, uh, provide auto scaling. So all the good stuff that Kubernetes has to offer. And the first version looked like something this, that uh, we used Fluent Bit and Fluent D because at that time, that was the two most uh, typical project planning, uh, logging uh, operations on Kubernetes. So Fluent Bit daemon said, just collected all the logs and uh, sent it to a Fluent D instance. And uh, we wrote a special plugin called the router, which helped you just uh, select uh, specific logs for specific uh, use cases or uh, specific flows. We call these uh, upper ones uh, logging flows. And you could apply different parsers, different uh, filters on top of that. 
and send them to one or more output. So in this case, you could have like all the logs sent to for, uh, in S3 for archive reason and developers logs into Grafana Loki, Elasticsearch, what, what, uh, so anything that you wanted. And this uh, image shows like how in resources, it looks like it, it's, it's an old picture. So it uh, changed a bit, but the, the basics are different. You have uh, namespaces and uh, you can apply flows or cluster flows uh, uh, into the cluster, which means uh, cluster flow can uh, collect logs from all the namespaces from all the pods, um, filter with selectors, and the flow is just working inside the namespace. So if you have only access to a namespace and you just can create flows, you can't collect um, logs from other uh, parts of the cluster. And the flows are usually connected to the outputs. You just have to define an output once and you could like con connect any flows to any kind of outputs. There was just one restriction. Cluster flows can only connect to cluster output, but flows can connect to uh, flow output and cluster output as well. It's just a simplification for operations. If you have, you know, like central collecting or some what, you don't need to like figure out what is the Elasticsearch, what is the S3 configuration. You don't even have to know about it. You just need to know the name of this uh, uh, resource. So just look a little bit in the, these resources. We try to abstract away as much as possible from a concrete agent configuration. If you ever configure, for example, FluentD or, 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 or a big cluster, auto configuration, whatever, those are really, really huge configurations uh, after a certain amount of time. Uh, so what you see here is a flow configuration that has a name that uh, identifies it. There is a selector here. It just selects, for example, based on Kubernetes labels. That was another thing that Kubernetes gives uh, to the um, users is the label. So it's really easy to just select specific pods, like, like a, a pod has app Nginx labels, then I can assume that it will be an Nginx log. And if I uh, want to parse it, I just only need to uh, apply an Nginx parser on top of it. So I don't have to guess what is uh, coming from my log. This saves a lot of time. If you just, if you only need like just one regex other than like trying all those one that runs in your cluster, um, yeah, that was the filter pipe. And at the end of the flow, you can uh, reference uh, different kinds of outputs. And the pairs for flows are outputs, which is usually like the uh, authentication management for outputs. So there are a couple of um, parameters that you can set. And uh, you can set like username, password, whatsoever. And logging operator offers that you can use uh, Kubernetes secrets for that. Why is it important? Because usually the collector and aggregator are, are not run by you. It's usually operated by the, I don't know, SRE team or whatsoever. So attaching secrets to those set collectors or, or, or aggregators in your cluster can be uh, troublesome, but logging operator does that automatically as well. Um, just to summarize, so we started like uh, in... To 2018, it's like almost five years ago. Uh, the the operator is uh, thriving, I would say. There is a lot of uh, interest in it. There is a lot of contributor, mainly coming from uh, companies that uh, apply logging operator and they, you know, missing some features, function whatsoever. So we are discussing them, you know, like the new features, how it can be solved with logging operator. And what I already said, that configuration check, scaling, secret management, uh, these are the most notable features that that helps uh, you operate the logging stack. And uh, I said that just, just a few uh, slides that I have, and uh, let's go and have some uh, demo. Um, but before I start, just wanted to say that uh, I had this slide about you know, the selectors. Uh, so first we started with Fluent with and uh, a year ago we added syslogng to the stack as well. So you can use syslogng instead of Fluent, which means you can have a much more um, um, flexible uh, routing uh, um, rules as well. So you can have or and 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 you can use regexps and not, and before fluently only 
uh, use the labels to match the messages. Now you can use the whole message. So you can use the labels, you can use the, the data inside the message. So it's much more flexible now to, to do this kind of stuff. And there is a really easy quick start. I will go through this. I already installed something that we just don't have to wait, you know, until the Helm and everything finishes. And I sketched in Figma, Figma Jam, just the architecture, how it looks like. So first I just installed the logging operator. This is just the operator in one container. And after that, I, I keep adding the, the resource it, uh, that it will reconcile. Uh, first, I will add this a Fluent Bit agent. It will uh, deploy a Fluent Bit daemon set that will be my collector. And after I will uh, add the logging resource, the logging resource embeds a syslogng configuration. It will start a syslogng stateful set. And uh, the, uh, to uh, add um, flows and outputs uh, that has a logging reference. So all outputs and flows um, connected to the logging reference, which is you can ignore just now. It just means that um, later we will build a multi-tenancy on top of that, but you can now just ignore it. So we will use a simple sync, uh, flow and output resource. Based on those information, it will generate a syslogng configuration, a fluent bit configuration, and we will have just the fluent bit receiver, HTTP receiver, that puts the logs in the HTTP output. So how it looks like uh, when it's uh, working. So just in check uh, what I have on my cluster. I installed the Prometheus uh, stack that you can ignore for now. And we have the logging and quick start namespaces. Just look a little bit into the uh, resources. I got the logging YAML, which is very, very thin. I just, uh, let me just a bit, uh, yeah, much better. So <laughs> it has just a name, some basic configuration and that's all. I have the fluent bit agent, which which can be added a lot of configuration, but the basic is just running well. It will deploy a fluent bit daemon set. And the first interesting part is the log generator flow. And here you can see that I just uh, have a log generator flow. It has an HTTP output and has a match expression that will use the JSON, the Kubernetes labels, uh, app Kubernetes IO instance, log generator pattern. So I installed a log generator on this cluster, which we can check just uh, uh, producing uh, syslogng, uh, not syslogng, an nginx type of logs in every second. So this is the, the input that we are expecting. And uh, we have our flow and we have an output for this uh, occasion as well. It's very simple. It's just an HTTP output. Um, we have this logging operator test receiver, which is, I already said that it's just a fluent bit uh, instance. And I can uh, just show you that this is how it works that you know, we collecting those uh, messages. We have, of course, the Kubernetes metadata attached by Fluent Bit and just output into a Fluent Bit uh, uh, instance, putting everything in STD out. So this is how it works. And the interesting part is that we can do a lot of other things during, you know, the processing of the pipeline. So I just quickly uh, jump to the latest version of my uh, configuration. It has a bit more information. It still collecting the log generator uh, uh, logs, still sending to the outputs. I just have two filters in place. The first one, this will parse the Nginx uh, uh, output logs. And after that, it will just get rid of this message field. You can see this is the unparsed message field. So what I will do here is just applying this Uh, this uh, resource and uh, it will take some time to upgrade the configuration. In the meantime, I just wanted to show you that how a syslogng configuration would look like that. Uh, so this is 
uh, this is the configuration generated by logging operator. So by hand, for this piece of code that I just showed, you would write this long configuration with has the destination, have the filter, the matching. There is explicit uh, generation of namespace matching because I just wrote, uh, wrote uh, the uh, flow, not a cluster flow. And after that, these are my parser and rewrite filters that I applied in my configuration. Mm -hmm. And if everything went well, now you can see that my logs change. I don't have the message field anymore, but I have the stream remote referral. So I just you know flattened out the Nginx access log. And there are a lot of things that we can do with this logging operator. We can do like log to metrics, and uh, we, we can just like count the resp uh, response codes uh, from a, a log. So it helps you know pre-processing the logs as well. And in an operation point of view. Another great thing is that you can have uh, an overview of your logging system because uh, we wanted a self-service system. So a lot of people can access to this, you know, this configuration can happen whatsoever. So there is a shortcut like uh, kubectl get logging goal is just an alias to get all the uh, logging related custom resources that logging operator use. And you can check that uh, whether uh, uh, an output or a flow is active, is there any problems uh, with it? And these information are also presented in the operator matrix. So in a case that you want to have monitor your self-service logging uh, cluster, you just need to collect these logs uh, in like Prometheus uh, and um, just uh, simple alerting rules that is there any uh, number of uh, of flows or outputs that are not active or have some problems? It's really easy to just, um, for example, I will add the flow without an output. What we will see here is that there is an, a flow, this flow that I just added, and it's not active and has one problems. Uh, and uh, it's really easy to just um, uh, print those uh, problems. I just print. So there is an just copy pasted the wrong one. This is what I need. Sorry, just messed up some namespaces. So we have the status field that has problems dangling local output reference HTTP phony. And in this way, you know, you can start debugging. And I wanted to show as well that uh, I just ins installed the Prometheus uh, cluster to like uh, have this. So I need my tabs back. This one. So this is the logging resource state uh, that I just showed on Kubernetes. And you, need, you can see the active, inactive ones, and you can see that there is an active, uh, but an inactive uh, logging flow in your cluster. So you can create rules on top of it. And uh, more of that, we added a lot of uh, metrics to syslogng as well. So you can check uh, your uh, outputs, how many uh, message you, uh, sent out how many messages you received and uh, you can even check the your filters how many filter meshed how much messages is meshed or not meshed so you can have a very deep insight what happening in your logging cluster and i think uh yeah just uh we'll finish up real quickly with the the future plans as well so uh, this is how it works briefly. There are a lot of things that you can do with a logging operator. And in the future, we are planning uh, more agents. So now we support FluentD and SyslogNG. Uh, we switched to SyslogNG because of performance reason and we want, uh, and it has a feature match for the FluentD. We want to try open telemetry collector to uh, fit in the system. 
there are a lot of custom use cases like uh, collecting blocks from inside pods and from on the host, making that first class citizen, citizen for logging operator. Now we have kind of workarounds for that. And we are working on multi-tenant support and routing on the edge. Uh, the multi-tenant support is a bit complex. <laughs> I won't go into details because it's really hard to describe. But the, the problem is that if you are, have a bad configuration, logging operator will start, uh, stops generating configs. So you can, you know, like uh, interrupt others' uh, log management. And if you have so much logs, you can just, you know, fill in the aggregator part of the system. So we split it in, uh, split it, uh, uh, a cluster into multi logging resources with dedicated uh, aggregators. So you won't have like these noisy neighbors and this kind of stuff. Uh, I can go into details if you want later. And the routing on the edge, which means that now we send everything to an aggregator and that's where the magic happens. And we want to push it on the node level, but it's it has, you know, its own problems, like the same that the aggregator has, you know, it's a shared resource. What happens if you can send out logs for a specific tenant? Um, how you can do multi hard multi-tenant, like, you know, the same collector can't collect the same uh, logs because you, I don't know, you have some compliance to do this. We are still under planning with this, but um, there are some really good thoughts and, uh, you know, we, we are communicating with the community as well, you know, which would be the, the, the good match. And uh, the, the question was how to, uh, you, you know, cooperate and, uh, you know, just... Uh, um, or use uh, the K Kubernetes. There is a separate uh, uh, a project like in GitHub called Kubelogging. And um, so uh, formerly it was Bonsai Cloud and after Bonsai Cloud acquired Cisco, we decided with Cisco to, to push this uh, to a third party organization and uh, applied into CNCF because we think, we believe that it can be useful for every uh, Kubernetes cluster users to have an abstract layer on top of the very good tools like Flint Beat, Syslog NG, and Open Parameter Collector, and contributing just start as any other open source projects. There are a lot of issues. There are a lot of pull requests. You can jump in. That's awesome. Uh, Sandor, is the cube logging project, um, uh, so it includes the operator. Is there anything else in the project that you have on GitHub right now? Yeah, there are a lot of things, the deployment, the hand chart, the documentation, there is mm -hmm. a log generator to have, you know, like test the system or demo like I did. Um, there is the agent building like Flint D image builder, Flint bit image builder. So a couple of stuff to support the uh, project. Cool, cool. So, and, and, um, uh, just one more question. Uh, the you mentioned that uh, you are starting to look at Otel collector. Um, yeah. Again, as you know, the collector has the Otel project has been working on logging. You know, and there is an existing uh, operator for Otel. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> can can this be again? Will this project, you know, this operator dovetail into? Yeah, so the main difference is that we the the hotel operator is for operating auto collector. So it's yeah, so managing you know the, yeah, the yeah. low level configuration. Yes, and we, yes. we manage a bit higher level. So it's like maybe logging operator can rely on auto operator to you know so right, auto operator just... instrument the low level, but yep. the high level like flows, labels, uh I had a, a presentation in KubeCon like using air, airbots as labels, uh, labels mm -hmm. as airbots. So you can actually, you know, uh, allow or disallow people to look into those. So this this is a, a layer above that uh, that level. Okay. Uh, I, I, no, no. I mean, this is very helpful. Um, again, I'll just let other folks. I have lots of questions. Matt, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Vijay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, the abstract layer right now is entirely fluent, right? So yeah. now the abstract layer is FluentD and SyslogNG. And what we are working on, because of Hotel as well, to make it real abstraction. So not like, uh, because there is a lot of, you know, uh, configuration that, uh, 
that uh, in the in the custom resources, you know, it's like when you uh, configure FluentD, there is the com FluentD specific filters parsers. Where you configure Syslog engine is the specific. And uh, now we are working on to abstract it a bit more away. And so you will have like the flows, like what to root where. So the routing will be definitely abstract uh, level. And the filters will be like something that you can customly add. And, and that will be only the specific, agent specific. So if you like want to add the regex parser, it has to be like agent specific, but we want to have this uh, routing and um, uh, a tenancy and whatsoever on top of and and, and I use that in the flows and outputs. Okay, uh, the, the specific question that I had is like, uh, uh, at any point, are you thinking of uh, allowing routing into, say, open telemetry collector? Uh, yeah, and then have open. Okay. Yeah, that was the same question, Vijay, that even I had. <laughs> Good question. In the interest of time, since we're at the halfway way point now, I'm yep. just going to. Um, I have a maybe this is a segue into the, to the question I alluded to earlier. Uh, what we've been talking about um, is really not the first instance of how should we organize filter graphs, right? Whether it's in open telemetry profiling, some of the work that happened last year, whether it's in how we conceptualize the collector and its inputs and outputs and, and intermediary layers. Um, and it, I, I personally run the both both the collector and the logging operator in the past, um, a much much earlier version of the logging operator. It, it seems to me that you have um, sort of a Venn diagram that's overlapping in terms of what concepts are modeled by the logging operator, constructs like flows and targets and things like that. Uh, and then Open Telemetry Collector has a slightly different view of the same underlying systems. I think a failure mode would be to have like, you know, dueling operators. Um, and so for, for, for users that want to like engage in this conversation or for many of the people on this call, I could easily see this being a two hour call because modeling the Open Telemetry as an agent in the Open Telemetry, uh, rather in the logging operator, uh, plus, you know, that kind of puts the OTO collector into a box and doesn't perhaps, that's one way to integrate the two, but one could imagine other ways to kind of bridge these gaps. And there, there are probably places in both projects that could that could benefit from being informed by the mental models exposed by the other. So for these kinds of conversations, this gets to my question about what's the governance of the project? How do people engage with it and contribute? For example, and then I'll, I'll let you answer because my question shouldn't be as long as it is already, but uh, are you operating in the open? Uh, in terms of like the code is there or are you having project meetings and taking input and discussing issues like this in the open with folks that might want to contribute or is it sort of a, a model where you have a, a closed or, or more yeah I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there more uh, limited so, community yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I understand the question and uh in yeah. scope the sandbox application it, that's notable uh because yeah. i took a quick look in this a lot uh, if there's anything notable that's not inclusive uh could you please call that out as well Thank you. Yeah, so I totally understand the question. Uh, right now, we are still preparing, you know, this kind of conversations. Um, I, I was um, attending some of the uh, auto projects, like, like for example, the agent management protocol and whatsoever in, in auto. And we, uh, like a year ago, we we tried to switch FluentD to auto collector, and we started to work on this uh, routing part, especially because there is, you know, this single. A uh, line of 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 uh, I don't know, like the order filters uh, version of of Otto, and you can you can't do this branching that's required, like the 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 functionality of logging operator. So, yeah, we we were thinking about how to you know uh, approach this. Um, so there is we we are still under uh, thing, uh, consideration of how to manage this. So we on Discord, you know, like there is a lot of guys coming and going and and, and we try to uh, co uh, connect with each of them and you know discuss about what would be best for the project there is no like organized version of this but definitely what we want to do is like have this regular you know discussion uh i personally i want to go to like hotel discussions as well so because there is a lot of uh, thing that's that's true and a yeah. lot and there, by the way I do. I don't want you to. For for example, the the concept of a flow, like a relationship yeah. between uh, uh, two inputs and outputs, that's something that's in, implied right now by by hotel. And you know, you, you do a mental map to to, to what, wire all these things together, right? So so I I do mean that there are places. That it, it appears that the out with the cursory investigation here, I, 
that both can benefit fr from the other. So I think the sandbox is a cool place. I yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Matt, you have a uh, right on point. And then I think Sandor also calls it out. I think it might be, you know, again, good to have a deeper dive on the, uh, you know, the areas of overlap as well as collaboration, right, on towards uh, just supporting you guys uh, also in, into, into, you know, kind of having a larger community with the hotel, larger hotel project. So, um, again, let's talk on Slack and we can figure out, you know, how to uh, get some of the hotel logging, you know, experts also who have been working on, on, you know, building out the logging functionality in hotel as well as the operator to talk. Uh, and Sandor, I'm sure you've already chatted with them, but it's just that maybe having a deeper dive and, you know, being able to support each other would be useful. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Let's take this offline and we'll we'll help organize yes. that just specifically to allow exactly this sort of cross project uh, collaboration and and, and conversations. Um, yeah, and sounds good. And good. and with that, Sandra, thank you again. Uh, super useful. Thank you for running through the presentation. Uh, and folks, you know where to find Sandra and the team uh, on the on the GitHub repo as well as on the CNCF Slack. Yeah. So with that, uh, let's uh, pull in our second project that is also applying for a sandbox application, CubeBurner, and Sai as well as his team, uh, will be presenting on this. So yeah. uh, hey. Raul, Sai, Vishnu, uh, yeah. good morning. Come, thank you for joining. Hey. hey, good morning. Vishnu, do you mind going into presentation mode, please? Yeah, so I'm going to try and breeze through some of this stuff. We may be short on time. I'll do my best to cover as much as we can. So again, thank you for having us. This is in regards to our sandbox application for Cube Burner. Uh, I'm here with a couple of my colleagues. Rahul, Vishnu, can you just quickly introduce yourselves and I can do the same? Hello, this is Rahul Sevilla. Um, I am a performance engineer working for Red Hat at the moment. I am based in Spain. I have spent, uh, uh, I think it's now almost three years working on improving Kubernetes. Vishnu. Hey, hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vishnu Challa. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work for OCP Performance and Scale Engineering team. And currently, I'm based out of Raleigh. And uh, it's just been um, eight months since I met with Red Hat. And yeah, I'm super excited about our, you know, future journey and, um, you know, the learnings as well. Thanks, awesome. thanks, Vishnu. Welcome, so, and, and so Sai, I'm the engineering manager for the uh, team that works in performance scale of Kubernetes and OpenShift at Red Hat. Uh, so if we can just move on to the next slide, please. Just a quick overview of what Kubernetes is for people that are looking at it for the first time. The one line summary is it's a Kubernetes performance and scale test orchestration framework, right? The key points of its functionality are definitely to create, uh, you know, update and delete resources at scale on Kubernetes at high competencies, right? I mean, if you were to even technically test the logging operator, we would be able to do that with, you know, Kubernetes by deploying the pods that spit out some logs uh, that was just talked about. We also do some Prometheus metric collection indexing to see how the platform behaves and responds while we're running different workloads. On top of the Prometheus metrics, we create our own custom measurements, like how long does it take for a pod to go from container creating all the way, scheduling all the way to ready. We also collect some pprops to identify bottlenecks when things are looking hard on the CPU. We also take custom expressions from the user and create alerts based on that and index the alerts. Things like, is that city having leader elections? Is, is you know things of that nature? Is the API always available or things like that? So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so building and running applications at scale is a key tenet of cloud native, right? And having a scalable platform with Kubernetes at the core is, is also a key tenet of this overall model. And the kind of questions that Kubernetes helps you answer is how big can my cluster be for this workload or how many pods can I run per node, right? Can I run 500 pods? Can I increase it up to 2000? Does it, how does that impact my API server? CRDs, which are which have been immensely popular and contributed to the success of uh, Kubernetes. How many CRDs are too much? How long is it taking for the open API spec to be generated on the API server side? Is it creating bottlenecks? As an architect, I want to know if I want to use Cilium, 
or some other CNI like Calico for my uh, Kubernetes cluster, and I want to be able to compare these. So I'm able to answer questions like that. How many services are too many on my cluster? Does it matter if the service is a node port? Does it matter if it's a cluster IT type of service? What is the performance of Kubernetes 128? Is it better or equal to 127? And even the wider ecosystem on top of Kubernetes, right? Has there been any regression because of an HCD version bump? So these are the kind of questions we are trying to answer with Kubeburner. And although this tool has been built by performance engineers, it's not certainly built only for performance engineers, right? There are different personas that are able to take advantage of this tool. Like for example, architects trying to size their Kubernetes clusters, do capacity planning, establish some SLOs, if they are even possible or if they are even in the realm of possibility, these SLOs. If you think about admins, you know, baselining the performance of the cluster, making sure that the SLIs are being monitored, even as an app developer, right? What do you expect from your platform, this cloud native platform? So things like these, you're targeting different personas and Kubernetes helps solve these challenges. If you can go to the next slide and pass it off to Raul real quick. Okay, so the next point is talk about, about how does Kubernetes works under the hood. So as a quick overview, we can say that Kubernetes is an applic a binary application written in Golang that makes an, ext an extensive usage of some well-known libraries like uh, Client Go, which is the SDK for Kubernetes, and this uses to interact with the API server. And also Prometheus, this one is kind of optional, but uh, we make usage of this library whenever we enable or indexing or alerting features. And it is, is uh, as the name suggests, to scrape Prometheus, the, the Prometheus API. Um, Kubernetes is meant to work against uh, vanilla Kubernetes clusters, but it's also, we can say that it's also extensible enough to work with other distributions of Kubernetes. Um, it uses an easy to read, and this is important as well, not over indented YAML configuration file that contains a set of jobs and instructions and definitions that Kubernetes will read and execute against the, the logit in cluster, against the cluster we are locating at the moment. Optionally, once Kubernetes finishes the executing these jobs defined in the previous configuration file, it can scrape the, a, a given Prometheus endpoint or set of Prometheus endpoints in order to collect uh, the metrics defined in the metrics defined in a in an special configuration file we called uh, we name a metric profile and index them into an external data source uh, which at the moment are, are, is supported elastic search slash open search or just regular JSON files uh, in the local in a local storage system. Uh, so they can be used for later re uh, retrieval and performance comparisons. Next one, Vishnu. So about Kubernetes, about Kubernetes partner jobs, uh, the main job, as I mentioned before, is the create job, which is basically meant for create objects in a given uh, currency uh, configured by the well-known parameters from the client Go library, QPS and burst. Um, but also we have uh, another couple of job types at the moment, which is deletes. It is delete that basically deletes the object described in the configuration file at the given currency, at the given rate, and patch, which uh, takes care of patching ob objects defined by defined in the configuration file. And pointed by pointed by a set of labels and namespaces, specifications, etc. Um, we have a, we have added a small diagram of how Kubernetes works. Uh, so the first step, the first stage of Kubernetes will, will be to read the configuration file and start what we call measurements. After reading that configuration file, once those measurements have started, we Kubernetes runs the performance scale test, which can consist of create, delete, or patch if objects. And once the, the benchmark finishes, it stops 
the measurements and starts the metric. Well, this step is kind of optional, but is one of the main features of QPartner, but it scripts uh, Prometheus to in order to to get the the metrics defined in the metrics profile uh, configuration file, and after that we optionally index those files in the in the mentioned uh, indexing systems: Open Search, Elastic Search, or Local File. Uh, next slide, please, no, please. At the moment, Kubernetes uh, supports three different types of measurements. We can define measurement like um, um, performance indicator not taken from from Prometheus metrics, but is but as something that is calculated from uh, in this case from from the API or the objects defined in Kubernetes or in the in the case of the prof collection, uh, it's something that it comes to that comes from the golden applications running on top of the Kubernetes cluster. So we are currently support three different types of three different types of measurements, which is full latency that basically takes care of calculating the different latencies across the different pod. Um, life cycle events like uh, uh, so I, I it allows you to you calculate a pod scheduling time scheduling latency pod ready latency and other there are other, another couple of uh, life cycle events and all of these all of these measurement all of these latencies are calculated at the moment in milliseconds due to the uh, granularity um exposed by the kubernetes api so uh, and it and it's, it is very useful to to evaluate performance of the cni and runtime again slos another measurement is people of what we call people of metrics uh, this measurement can be used to to collect profiling information from goal and processes running on on top of pods from the cluster and to do so uh, Basically, QPartner connects to these pods using a set of label selectors and namespace and continually, continuously, well, polls or sends requests to the specified people of endpoints and retrieves the, the collected people of files and downloads it, downloads them from into a local into a local directory. Uh, these people of files can be used, can be really useful to detect bottlenecks, um, improve their, uh, to be a good uh, source to code optimization and detect uh, other issues like memory leaks, etc. And can be used to for cloud visualizations like flame graphs or ice cycle graphs as well. And last but not least, we also collect VMI latency, uh, which are VMI and VM latency for from QBIRT uh, virtual machines. Uh, same as regular pods, we are also able to collect the latencies from the different the different lifecycle events from these kind of objects from QBIRT. Mm. Okay, next slide. I think you're next. Yeah, so yeah, once we have all the benchmarks run, uh, we also do collect metrics from the cluster. So this is a higher level overview on how we collect the metrics. So we scrape, we connect to the Prometheus endpoints and then scrape all the metrics, process them, and then publish them to our desired destination. So currently we do support Prometheus as well as previously local indexed metrics as sources, and then we process, we parse those metrics, and then we publish to our destination, which will be open search slash elastic search, as well as our local file system. And few add-ons on top of this feature are not only uh, metrics during the benchmark run, but also we have this functionality to scrape metrics from a previously run benchmark by indicating its start and end times. And also we can simply have a previously indexed 
tartball, which is in our local file system as an input to import all those metrics and then process on top of them. Moving on to the next slide. So as a roadmap, uh, we were we are thinking of including a lot more new features. So some of the key ones are uh, a payload scenarios, wherein we want to test the load uh, being performed on API, uh, which, which, will, which will again be an add-on on top of our current scenarios. And also we are looking at uh, some of the improvements in the measurements uh, to not only support Prometheus, but also to extend its functionality to other sources as well. For example, a uh, quick one which we are looking at is Dynatrace. And also we are looking at improvements to our KHC events because we extensive use, extensively use client flow library to you know, optimize uh, our logic to look at those events and process on top of them. And also we are looking to add a new feature to dump all the Prometheus metrics so that it will be easy for us to uh, switch all those metrics from a Prometheus to another Prometheus source and also to analyze on top of them. And also we are looking uh, for a few more optimizations on the alerting functionality uh, based upon our threshold configured for the benchmarks. And there are a lot many new scenarios which we are trying to include uh, in measurements as well as the benchmark report generation as well. The below mentioned GitHub uh, issue, uh, a GitHub link for the roadmap talks about uh, the ones which we are looking uh, in our upcoming uh, three to six months to get them resolved. Right. I'm just going to breeze through this community and uh, YC and CNF parts, which I think are very important to address here. Kubernetes has been in active development since three years. It is the primary vehicle on which all of, uh, currently all of Red Hat's performance and scale testing of Kubernetes and OpenShift happens. And with zero marketing so far, our main contributions are obviously from Red Hat, but with zero marketing so far, we have contributions from IBM, Play, Play Upbound, Enterprise DB so far. We are also aware of end user adoption, uh, including Bosch and ANZ Bank. We've also been in numerous customer conversations with some of the biggest telcos in the US presenting them data that we got from Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes for Kubernetes performance and scale because the control plane scalability aspect is also really essential for the telco core clusters. And our vision is to make Kubernetes the most user-friendly and versatile tool to understand performance and scale. And we believe that having the participation of the community is key here, as you can see, We've always driven the project through issues. We don't have any other mechanism of tracking project work internally. Even if it's an internal request, we ask them to open an issue upstream and we prioritize it there. We have conversations out in the open. And being at Red Hat, I mean, this is the only model we've ever been exposed to, right? Building software in the open source way. And Vishnu, if you can just go to the next slide, I'll really quickly touch on YC and CF. Uh, I think there is an unfulfilled need here. And I think it this is the right area for CNCF sandbox because on top of experimentation, that is one of the charter areas. There is a need for performance and scale. We want to trust performance and scale to the forefront of cloud native conversations, right? Cloud native is all about population scale. And just like chaos engineering is about ensuring stability of the cluster under faults, we believe that performance under load or scalability is a key tenet of all cloud native development. And we want to meet this unfulfilled need that a lot of you know end users and other platform companies have about Kubernetes performance and scale. Obviously, we want to drive adoption, contributions and collaboration. And I think getting the sandbox status and having this neutral home will help drive that. Uh, and also we have a roadmap based on our requirements and what we're hearing from GitHub issues and so on and so forth. But if we can get more community behind this, we can build something that adds value to the entire community. And again, make sure that performance and scale are first class citizens because they're really essential to build and run those scalable applications. The scalability of the platform as we have seen over the years, this is super important. Uh, we are also pretty serious about our commitment to Kubernetes and you know the CNCF collaboration. We want to take it to a point where we catalyze the incubation level success. Um, so that is it for what we have for slides. If we have time, we can do a two minute demo and questions. If not, I mean, I would I would lean on to Matt and Lolita to let us know. This is the end of the formal presentation deck, but we do have a two to three minute demo that we can show Kubernetes in action and open it up for questions. So let us know what you want to do. So why don't you go ahead with the demo? I know we are five minutes before 10 uh, Pacific time. Uh, so please go ahead and, and folks, please yeah. ask your questions on the chat in the meantime, and then we can quickly yes. round up with a couple of minutes of Q&A. Thank you. Go ahead, Vishnu. Yeah, sure. 
by now everyone might, might have understood that uh, kubernetes can be run on any kate distribution so i'll just show you a small workload running on my openshift cluster and it's working so this is the official uh, kubernetes docs which will help you to understand the you know um, configuration details which i'm talking about here in more detail so i'll be running a small workload called cluster density v2 which is used in our openshift runs to you know uh, analyze the cluster so what this workload does is uh, it just deploys a client server pair along with a service and route configured on top of it with some network policies and also it does have a build and stream so it mimics a smaller and smaller version of a small application and then this is the main configuration file which will be the main entry point of kubeburner so when you want to run a workload on top of kubeburner we would need to design a config file like this so these are some of the attributes i'll just walk through the main ones more can be explored in the docs just in interest of time so the global config gc indicates that uh, after the workload is run garbage collection has to be option happen to clean up all the resources in the cluster and this is the indexer config where this answer the question on where we can publish all our results it can be elastic search open search or a local file system and this is the measurement section wherein you specify what kind of measurements to collect for example we have options like pod latency vml latency and p profiles of at this moment and this is the job section where you specify a list of jobs that needs to be run as a part of workload and in the job section each job can have its own configuration by default it's a create job you can specify other type jobs as well and in the job section apart from all the attributes these are some of the main ones which indicate how a job should look like in the object section is where you specify all the list of yml files if you look at the directory structure here these are related to this to this folder which indicates that what objects to be deployed as a part of this workload to stress the cluster so these are all the con kubernetes configuration files which will be deployed as a part of this workload while it is in action and then on top of it we analyze the measurements and then scrape them and then you know uh, index them to our destination uh, let's see this working on my cluster so i have a small openshift cluster configured and uh, this is the command which we use to trigger the workload. So this is kubernetes binary and then init sub command and the dash c flag demands for the configuration file, which I showed you earlier, which basically hyperlinks to all those resources which need to be deployed as a part of this workload. And also this indicates, these two options indicate Prometheus URL and token, <laughs> and this indicates a metrics profile file. So this metric profile file is nothing but a bunch of Prometheus queries based upon users use case and and having those aliases to them so this will be helpful once you run the workload if you want to uh, analyze the metrics these alias names will be helpful to look at those specific values so now that we have all the assets ready to trigger a workload let's trigger a smaller one so this is how the workload looks in action so initially it establishes a connection with our destination indexer as well as prometheus endpoint and then starts the workload at the start of this workload it adds a starting point to collect the measurements which will be nothing but which is, which is nothing but a watcher continuously looking for all those metrics during the workload and then starts deploying all the resources on top of the cluster so here you can look, take a look at the qps and burst being used to trigger this workload and all the resources which are being deployed on top of the cluster meanwhile we can just take a look at the resources which were being triggered as a part of this workload. So for example, we will start noticing the resources being deployed in this namespace. So Kubernetes automatically creates those namespace with the uh, you know, respect to prefix indicating that workload and the iterations. We are just running one iteration and we have all these resources being deployed in this namespace. So once the workload is done, it stops that measurement factory, which basically stops the measurements watcher and then scrapes the metrics from the cluster Prometheus. Once the metrics are in memory, it takes them to fly and then, and then indexes them to their destination, which is, which is going to be Elasticsearch. So once we have the metrics indexed at Elasticsearch, we can take a look on top of them So for example, if we just look at those metrics with the UID, we should be able to see all the metrics here. 
So if we keep on working uh, in detail, like it, it's going to be a longer topic, but I can just show you a quick overview of how does it look like. So this was uh, one of our previous runs, wherein we had our workload run, and these are the higher level metrics. So it talks, first of all, it gives some information about the infrastructure of the cluster on which the test was run to indicate our system under test, as well as some of the uh, you know resources which were deployed up as a part of the workload. And also it indicates the job configuration, like what QPS was used and how many iterations it ran and how much time it took for the workload to run. During that time, if you look at the metrics, you should be able to see some of the key metrics as a part of the output. So some of them indicate the cluster status. Hey Vishnu, I think I think we are probably running out of time here. Just, let's just take a pause and see if we have any questions or if we can take further questions on Slack. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, back this to is you, man. Hello, Lit. Thanks. I I was just uh, suggesting that you know again there is a whole control plane uh, performance uh, optimization work group in. Open telemetry that has actually been, you know, testing with Prometheus, uh, scraping uh, of metrics and and you know kind of scaling that out. So would definitely encourage you to speak with them. Um, Absolutely. And of course, uh, also you know, given that your main, I mean, are you looking at other data sinks, uh, as well as other metrics? We are uh, currently, uh, and that would be an area of collaboration, but. Primarily, this started out as a performance and scale tool, right? The yeah. charter is performance and scale, and you know the metrics are to back up the performance data to understand the system. Yeah. So we're definitely open to collaboration there. If somebody is already building something there that we could easily integrate uh, and help further our mission, yeah, I'm definitely interested to talk and know further. Um, are you also planning to do like uh, standardized templates for flame graphs, etc., uh, for for you know as for from a performance standpoint? We we don't have that right now, but we collect the pprof and you know regular ways of consumption of the pprof on the web server. You know we could do a flame graph or an icycle graph. We don't tend to dictate any of that, but we just help collecting the pprofs for API server or etcd or whatever to help identify the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Because there there is a fair bit of overlap with some of the other observability projects. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in that area, Matt. Did you have a question? Um, I'm sorry, there's a delay. I don't want to cut you off. Probably. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I know oh, we're uh, over time. <laughs> yeah, we're over time. So I would briefly say thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah. uh, looking forward to following up. I would encourage you, as Alina mentioned, to look at some of the other projects that are in the sandbox and or incubation now. For example, some of which uh, the Litmus project, who's, a, who's presented here, uh, have a nice framework for collecting benchmarks in a standardized way that, um, that you might be able to get some ideas from them or or, or vice versa. Um, uh, in addition, you know, just when, when one looking at systemic Kubernetes performance, it's very, very easy to get into like too many equations, not enough variables, um, or right. rather, the other way around. Uh, so things like the Nighthawk project on the networking layer uh, that look to do benchmarking for service meshes, which can be hugely impactful on, on networking performance and lots of other projects like them. Uh, yes. do it. So I would love to understand what projects you've reached out to and, and how you see uh, Kubernetes fitting in the context of the existing projects. Um, yeah, so we've already touched on all of these projects before. So Litmus is more around chaos engineering. Our goal is performance and scale, okay, so there is that. I, I, I don't mean to say that uh, it's the same. I, I just mean that in that project, they have done a, a significant amount of work to Got it. implement. And it also exists uh, in a more narrow uh, a scope uh, in Kubernetes around how do we have a generalized framework for collecting measurements and tests in a consistent way that's for to do scale tests that, you know, so like there are ideas again, like the previous talk, and, and I think the sandbox and this tag exists to kind of cross pollinate that. So I'm, I'm thrilled to, to learn more and, and would encourage you to reach out to those projects. And, and we can also Absolutely. make a fun discussion or, or a separate discussion outside the context of this short meeting. But thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for all your inputs, guys. No, no, thank you again for both projects and really appreciate the demos. Uh, I think the, and, and the presentations, again, we will post the videos, uh, video as soon as uh, it's ready. Thanks again and have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Thanks you for too. joining. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you for having us. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.